Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the inaugural webinar in the Garfunkel Weill Nursing Home Webinar Series. Uh, today, we're going to talk about fraud and abuse, and in particular, we're going to focus on the Esformis case, which the United States government has called the largest healthcare fraud case in the history of the United States. Uh, as I mentioned, this is the inaugural one. This is this is the first episode. We have a whole series of uh, webinars planned for the upcoming year uh, that are all going to address various legal issues that arise in the context of owning, operating, and administering uh, nursing homes. What what that means is we're going to address things like fraud and abuse, and we're going to address issues uh, related to the business of the nursing homes. Uh, the compliance with various rules, including personnel rules uh, and federal and state requirements. Our next uh, webinar is going to be in about one month, uh, and that's going to focus on uh, the compliance with the uh, Americans with Disabilities Act, in particular in connection with leave requests and family medical leave requests. We're also going to address in that webinar the uh, one of the latest uh, disabilities recognized by the federal government, which is opioid abuse disorder. That's going to be uh, hosted by my partner, Roy Breitenbach, and that's going to be a very uh, helpful and I think very timely uh, presentation. Once After that, we have, a, as I mentioned, we have a whole series uh, coming up addressing a bunch of different issues that uh, are all of what we think great importance to nursing home owners and operators. So let's, let me introduce myself first. As you know, my name is John Martin. I'm a partner at Garfunkel Wild. Before I came to Garfunkel Wild, I, was a, I started my legal career as a prosecutor in the Manhattan DA's office, where I worked for Robert Morgan now for 18 years. After that, I spent five years as an assistant U.S. attorney in the Eastern District of New York, uh, where I handled complex white-collar criminal prosecutions, and I handled a number of healthcare fraud investigations. But for the last 11 years, I've been a partner in the Compliance and White-Collar Defense Department, as well as the Litigation Department at Garfunkel Wild. And in that, in that role, I've represented nursing homes, I've represented administrators, owners, I've represented nursing directors uh, and, and physicians in both criminal and civil cases in which the government is investigating fraud or abuse. Now, one other thing I want to mention before we get started is obviously we have a slide presentation going along with uh, my words. At the end of this presentation. We will be emailing a copy of all the slides uh, to all participants, so you will have a record of uh, what happened and what was said and done today. Now let's get to the topic at hand. We're going to talk about Philip S. Formis, who, as I mentioned, according to the United States government, is the perpetrator of the largest healthcare fraud in the history of the United States. But before we get to Philip S. Formis, we have to, we have to go back a little bit further and talk about Philip's father, Morris Esformis. Because Philip Esformis did not enter the nursing home business uh, without prompting. His father was also in the nursing home business and was also extremely successful. And in fact, his father was involved in co-ownership with Esformis of many of the nursing homes and, and assisted living facilities that were at issue in the Esformis case. But his father's problems go all the way back to 1998 when the Chicago Tribune disclosed that he had been using recruiters to uh, scout homeless shelters uh, for inappropriate admissions to his nursing homes, which is an interesting point, And I only bring it up because we'll see a little bit of that again when we look at what Philip S. Formis uh, is going to jail for. So, the other thing to understand about Philip S. Formis is that the criminal case that we've all been hearing about and reading about was not his first rodeo. Philip and his father had been uh, sanctioned by the federal government on a number of occasions prior to this case, starting as early as 2006, when they paid $15.4 million to settle a case for paying kickbacks for patient referrals, which 
again, not surprisingly, is part of the same scheme of conduct that he's currently spending probably the rest of his life in jail for. Uh, he and his father uh, settled that lawsuit without admitting wrongdoing, uh, but they were required to have a monitor in place. Now, there was a second incident uh, in which the, Esformis and his father were involved in the sale of a nursing home pharmacy company that was being held up, and they agreed to let the sale go through in exchange for taking kickbacks. And a whistleblower filed a case, and they were forced to pay $5 million. You might think that paying $20 million in damages for violations of the law would put a dent in either their wealth or their willingness to engage in misconduct. But it didn't seem to do either, particularly with respect to wealth. Shortly prior to his indictment, uh, Philip Esformis filled out a liability and net worth document in connection with a financial transaction. And I have the excerpts up on the screen right now. And the bottom line is that despite paying $20 million uh, to the federal government, he was worth $78 million when this case began. How did Philip Esformis end up going to jail. How did he go from a $78 million man who owned approximately 30 nursing homes and assisted living facilities, uh, who had a private jet uh, and was living the high life to where he is now? What did he do? Philip Esformis' conduct that resulted in his indictment and his conviction can basically be broken up into six areas. First of all, and perhaps most run of the mill, he paid bribes and kickbacks and received bribes and kickbacks from physicians and other entities. He paid the bribes and kickbacks to induce referrals of patients to his nursing facilities. And he received bribes and kickbacks from doctors and other providers to allow them access to the patients he had who were in uh, one or more of his either nursing facilities or assisted living facilities. Another aspect of the scheme was the recycling of patients. And we'll talk in a little more detail about uh, later on about the, uh, the th Medicare three-day rule. But as Formis was uh, intimately familiar with uh, the Medicare rules regarding the timing of admissions and readmissions. And he manipulated those rules to be able to recycle patients so they could have multiple uh, visits to his nursing homes. And again, another more typical run-of-the-mill type of fraud. He provided phantom and unnecessary goods and services to patients who were in his facilities. And he also played games with the medical records to make it look like those services were provided or were medically necessary. Then we have a category called inappropriate admissions. And you will recall a moment ago when I was talking about Morris as formats, I talked about him scouring uh, homeless shelters for patients to admit. Philip Esformis took this to another level and admitted uh, drug addicts and psychotic patients who he was unable to care for. Uh, now, we have the typical bribes and kickbacks, which I talked about, that he paid to doctors for referrals. Uh, but we have uh, some, some unusual bribes that he paid in this case as well. Uh, Philip Esformis bribed public officials to stay out of trouble, and he actually bribed a coach to admit his son to college. Finally, what is perhaps the most damaging thing that Philip S. Formas did was his obstruction of justice schemes. Nothing, nothing irritates, aggravates a, a defendant or a, sub, a suspect situation more than obstructing the investigation. And as Formas was caught on tape taking steps to obstruct the federal investigation. So that combination of six categories of conduct are what put him where he is today. Now let me talk about each of these in a little more detail. Uh, the, as I mentioned, the bribes and kickbacks were relatively, uh, I'll call them unremarkable, because it's something that we see over and over again, uh, where a facility engages in uh, an arrangement with a potential referral source, 
and either by some sort of cash payment or more commonly by uh, paying for vacations, paying for meals, uh, and other disguised ways, they reward that referral source for referring patients. Uh, and the Swarmist did that with Augusto. And his nursing homes and his uh, assisted living facilities rarely had available beds as a result. The other type of kickback that the Swarmist was involved in was a, was a little more unusual, which is that uh, because he owned assisted living facilities, and Medicare uh, will not pay for assisted living facilities, but Medicare will pay for medical services provided at an assisted living facility. So as Formas uh, decided to take kickbacks from the doctors who he would allow to see his patients at his assisted living facilities and from the pharmacies that would fill their prescriptions in order for the privilege of seeing his patients. And in this regard, as Formas did something that we have seen a little bit of, but again, he took it a little farther, is he had two brothers, the Delgado brothers, set up a corporation that would enter into these kickback arrangements. So the Delgado Brothers Company would enter into contracts and agreements with the doctors who would come to the assisted living facilities, whereby the doctors would pay exorbitant amounts for the privilege of seeing and billing for services provided to Medicare and Medicaid patients. The Delgados would then split the proceeds of their kickback scheme with S. Formas. And the Delgados will come back again when we get to obstruction of justice. I also talked about recycling of patients. Again, I mentioned that Aswarmas uh, was intimately familiar with the Medicare rules regarding the timing of patients and the ability to readmit patients to skilled nursing facilities. So what Aswarmas did was when one of his patients at one of his skilled nursing facilities reached the end of their Medicare coverage period, typically 100 days, Aswarmas would have them transferred to one of his assisted living facilities. And he would keep them in the assisted living facility for the required period, which is 60 days. At that point, one of the doctors who was on the Aswarmas kickback payroll would readmit that physician for a three-day stay in a hospital. And then, after the three days in the hospital, would readmit that patient to a to an Asformis nursing, skilled nursing facility where, once again, Medicare would start paying. Phantom and unnecessary goods and services doesn't require a great deal of explanation. Asformis uh, up, upcoded and falsely reported the level of services that he was providing to patients in his facilities um, he, he, his facilities routinely provided medically unnecessary services, uh, and they doctored medical records to make these uh, appear appropriate. Now, the inappropriate admissions. Uh, as for this, his nursing, his skilled nursing facilities did not, as most skilled nursing facilities do not, have the capacity to treat drug addicts, alcoholics, and psychotics. Uh, those patients have particularly uh, expensive and, and specialized needs. Asformis would nevertheless ex routinely accept those patients into his skilled nursing facilities in order to keep the beds full. In addition, he would bill for services allegedly provided to these patients, even though they weren't getting the services. In fact, the evidence at trial showed that these types of patients were typically allowed to leave the facility in the morning and come home and sleep there at night. In addition, as Formas encouraged the physicians who were seeing these patients to prescribe controlled substances to them so that they would stay at the facility. The bribes to public officials that I mentioned earlier. In Florida, like in New York and like in most places, Skilled nursing facilities, assisted living facilities, are subject to unannounced visits from government regulators. Uh, and this is how they make sure that the facilities are being operated properly. They show up unannounced. Esformis didn't want unannounced uh, regulators showing up at his facilities, particularly because there might be uh, drug addicts and alcoholics wandering the halls that 
because patients wouldn't be getting treatment uh, that they should have been getting, uh, and conditions weren't great. So he located someone in the department, in the Florida version of the Department of Health, who was willing to take kickbacks in exchange for giving him a heads up when the regulators were coming to inspect his facilities. As a result, Philippus Formis had a very good track record with the on-site inspections because he had time to prepare for them. Now, I mentioned that he paid bribes to public officials and others. The others included the coach of the University of Pennsylvania basketball team. As Formis paid $300,000 to the coach of the Pennsylvania basketball team to get his son admitted as a scholarship student on a basketball scholarship. The problem was that his son was not that good a basketball player, never played for the team, uh, and had no uh, entitlement to a scholarship. But because of Asformis' $300,000 payment to the coach, the son was admitted and was able to attend the Wharton School of Business at the University of Pennsylvania. Finally, obstruction of justice. And I mentioned before, this is probably one of the, one of the uh, things that he did that is most largely responsible for where he finds himself now. Uh, his obstruction of justice, the, I, I told you before about the Delgado brothers. Uh, the Delgado brothers were aware, or became aware at some point that the government was looking at them. Uh, in connection with that, uh, Asformis suggested that should they get indicted, suicide might be a better alternative to facing the charges, because Asformis was clearly afraid that they would turn on him. And that is what led, that comment is what led them to turn on him. And they actually tape recorded a conversation in which he outlined a scheme whereby he would pay for one of the Delgado brothers to flee to Israel and hide out while the, while the remaining Delgado brother would go to trial. And he explained that the remaining brother could point the finger at the missing brother and say, I didn't do all this. It was the other brother who did all these bad things and I'm innocent. Uh, that scheme as I mentioned, that was recorded on tape and played for the jury at his trial. So based on that evidence, S. Formis was, as we all know, convicted in, quote unquote, the largest healthcare fraud scheme in the history of the United States. The government alleged that it was a $1.3 billion fraud. Uh, but as they are wont to do, the government was exaggerating a little bit. Uh, in the end, uh, the court found that uh, Asformis was really responsible for a much lower level of fraud, but it was more the egregious nature of his conduct and the repeated and insistent uh, obstruction and, and deceptive conduct that led to his uh, extreme punishment, which we'll talk about. Let's talk about punishment. Asformis was convicted uh, of multiple counts of federal felonies and that he was facing a potential sentence of up to 225 years in jail, 255 years, pardon me. Um, now, one of the things uh, when looking at the sentencing proceedings that's a little bit extraordinary is his attorneys asked the judge to sentence him to 10 years, uh, which is an extraordinarily long sentence for a white collar criminal who commits a nonviolent crime in which nobody died, and who has no prior criminal record. As I mentioned, he had civil settlements that involved no admission of liability. Uh, so when, when your own attorneys are coming into court asking for a 10-year sentence, you, you have a good sense that things are not going well. The government asked for a 30-year sentence, uh, which would not have been the longest sentence anyone ever got for health care fraud in this country, but I think it would have uh, equaled the longest sentence. He didn't get 10 or 30 years, he got 20 years. Uh, despite 100, more than 100 letters uh, describing his wonderful personality, his community service, his care for his patients, all the great things he did, and to even the trial judge who sentenced him explained that outside of his health care fraud, he appeared to be a very decent person who cared about other people.
has, and that's the press release, again, announcing 20 years for the quote-unquote largest healthcare fraud scheme ever charged. Um, and not surprisingly, S. Fornis intends to appeal his conviction. Um, the problem he will face in appealing his conviction is, as I mentioned, he engaged in such a wide variety of criminal conduct and was convicted of so many different counts that even if he enjoys some success on appeal, which is always difficult, but even if he manages to enjoy some success, it's almost impossible that he will be able to overcome all of the counts of conviction and all of the wrongdoing that he was found guilty of by the jury. So one of the uh, thoughts behind this webinar would be to try to see what we can take away from the Asformis case uh, to help current employees, owners, operators of nursing homes avoid becoming the next Asformis. But after careful analysis, I think any, most people will conclude that if you, are, if you care enough uh, to tune into this webinar, you probably already understand the wrongfulness of the things he did. For example, I probably don't need to explain to this group that paying physicians to refer patients, paying hospitals to refer patients is going to get you in trouble. I don't need to explain that taking kickbacks from doctors to let them see your patients is going to get you in trouble. I don't need to explain, I hope, that uh, bringing alcoholics and drug addicts into your facility without the ability to treat them is a bad idea. And I presume I don't need to explain that you should not be advising witnesses to commit suicide or flee the country when the government is investigating you. As far as his conduct was so uh, offensive and so blatant that it is hard to draw lessons from it. But as a general matter, what the Aswarmus case should help remind us of is that the nursing home industry is one of the most regulated and watched industries in the country. Probably no other industry has as many different government entities charged with uh, investigating and disciplining and overseeing its operations or as many potential prosecutors who are chomping at the bit for the opportunity to bring a case against someone involved in the nursing home. Uh, you know, the, the public perception uh, when the government brings a case against the nursing home is generally very negative. Uh, most people uh, read these stories in the paper and the only stories in the paper are about the bad nursing homes. And when they see one of these cases, the juries are, are very quick uh, to take the government side and convict. So in, in, in the nursing home industry, you have a combination of incredibly complex regulation, a myriad of entities looking closely at every step you take, and criminal prosecutors who know that if they can, if they can bring a charge, they can probably sell it to a jury. So, and, and Esformis sort of exemplifies that uh, because of the, you, you look at the resources and the years that were spent going after him uh, and the way the Department of Justice continually called it the biggest case of the century, uh, you can imagine that similar prosecutorial agencies will treat other, will treat nursing homes similarly. So, there are a few issues that came up in the Asformis case that I think do lead to some, some topics that, that people who are currently uh, in operating or working in the nursing home industry need to be aware of and address. So one of the issues, uh, and, and I have the four of them up on the screen. Um, one of the issues is the three-day stay. And I talked a little bit before about how Asformis uh, manipulated the, moved his patients around in order to take advantage of the three-day stay rule. He bribed doctors to help him with it. He bribed hospitals to help him with it. Um, and, and, you know, obviously the kickbacks and the bribery were wrong. But this is, this is a little bit more, uh, I guess, uh, 
frightening to legitimate nursing home operators. In February of this year, the OIG did a, uh, a, a sample of, of 99 admissions to skilled nursing facilities. And according to the OIG, out of those 99 admissions, 65 of them did not comply with the three-day stay rule. Now, myself, based on my experience with nursing homes and nursing home enforcement, as well as my partners, all agree that that number seems inflated. But even if it's half of that number, it's a significant problem. And it's a significant problem for a number of reasons. Nursing homes need to bear in mind that the interest of the nursing home versus the interest of the hospital conflict when it comes to how long this patient spends in the hospital. The nursing home does not want and will not get paid if they accept a patient who has not spent the full three days in the hospital. But the hospital will get paid regardless of how long that patient stays in. So the hospital wants that patient out so they can stop spending money on that patient. So it's in the hospital's interest to get the patient out as soon as possible, but that's not in the nursing home's interest. And what this study found was that one of the main reasons that a lot of the admissions that they looked at did not meet the three-day requirement was that uh, there was inadequate communication between the hospitals or bad information was provided by the hospitals. Um, so what, and, and now let's think for a minute what the consequences are of this. If the three-day stay requirement is not met, that patient is not eligible for Medicare reimbursement, period, from day one. So if a patient who doesn't meet the three-day requirement is admitted to a skilled nursing facility, they could stay there for a month. And when Medicare does an audit and uncover, and when CMS does an audit and uncovers and realizes that the three-day stay requirement was not met, that entire dollar amount is going to come back. And even worse, potentially, if they think that the, nurse, the skilled nursing facility is somehow at fault, there are potential penalties, sanctions, there's even a potential for a False Claims Act case. So, and again, bearing in mind that the hospitals don't really care whether the three-day uh, requirement has been met. It's, in, it's extremely important for nursing, skilled nursing facilities to develop a sophisticated system of ensuring that the three-day stay requirement has been met before the patients are admitted and documenting the efforts they, go, they engage in to ensure that. And the reason why that's necessary is because in the event that someone does get in who shouldn't have gotten in, does get admitted who shouldn't have been admitted, and in the event that the federal government later uncovers that, you want to be able to say to the government, it wasn't our fault, we did our best, we tried to verify the three-day stay, but we repeatedly got bad information from the hospital, the patient, whoever else you've spoken to. So it's my strong recommendation that everyone take this issue very seriously and consider implementing additional policies to assure yourselves that you're not accepting patients who do not qualify because they fail to comply with the three-day rule. Um, another area, and again, uh, I'm starting with federal uh, uh, focus on nursing homes uh, because the Asformis case was a federal case and the, the three-day rule is also a federal rule. Um, federal government and federal prosecutors typically focus on kickbacks and illegal referrals. That's their focus. Uh, and so those are the main concerns that nursing homes have with respect to federal regulators and federal prosecutors. And we see these coming down every now and then uh, from the U.S. Attorney's offices, from the OIG. Uh, and the, the, if you search the nursing homes under the Department of Justice website, you'll see most of their prosecutions of nursing homes relate to this subject. Uh, on the other hand, the state prosecutors have slightly different priorities. The state prosecutors generally do not bring uh, kickback cases. They do occasionally. There is a state kickback law. Uh, 
But the state prosecutors, and particularly in New York, the Attorney General's Medicaid Fraud Control Unit, tend to uh, focus on uh, uh, smaller issues and more uh, location-specific issues. Uh, one example is uh, delayed patient discharges. Uh, this, this is a situation that exists when the patient no longer medically requires skilled nursing services. But typically uh, happens when the patient still has what we call Medicare days left. They're still eligible for Medicare coverage if they need the services, but they don't. And nursing homes can get into problems, and we've seen it. And here's a recent example of uh, prior attorney general bringing a case on it uh, where they extend that stay, where they come up with some reason why that uh, resident needs additional skilled nursing facilities, um, sometimes even when the resident doesn't want to stay and get additional services. Uh, so this is an area that I think, you know, discharge planning and appropriate discharge is, is uh, something of a hot topic. It's It can be the subject of a federal investigation. It can be the subject of a state investigation. And as this really shows, uh, this is something that the Attorney General is indeed interested in. But let's get to what the Attorney General spend and the Medicaid Fraud Control Unit spend most of their resources and most of their energy on, which is patient abuse, sexual abuse, physical abuse, or neglect. Uh, now, these are areas over which uh, everyone, in which everyone is aware that, that, that these are the third rail of nursing homes, that patient abuse can result in tremendous harm to the home, tremendous harm to the uh, reputations of, of the home, of the owners, uh, and can result in incredible scrutiny from the government. But from we're, we're aware here that nursing homes are already very aggressively a, 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 taking actions and, and engaged in training and oversight to try to prevent as much as they can patient abuse and patient neglect. But the fact is there's only so much nursing homes uh, can do. The people who work in these homes are human beings. They're not perfect people. They have failings. They occasionally misbehave. They occasionally neglect patients. It's going to happen. But where nursing homes can protect themselves is avoiding the cover-up. And I think everyone's heard at some point in your life, it's not the crime, it's the cover-up. But in the nursing home area and in the patient abuse area, that's really the case for the nursing home management, for the nursing home owners and operators. Because the management and the owners and the operators are never abusing or neglecting their patients. It's the lower level employees who are. However, when one of the more common fact patterns is one of two things. Either an incident happens and someone at the facility, often the perpetrator, but, some, but quite often a supervisor or an administrator, decides to try to either cover it up completely, not report it, uh, completely uh, avoid acknowledging that it even happened, or they submit a false report or they change medical records to try to make it look like an intentional uh, incident was an accident or try to make it look like an injury was minor when it really wasn't minor. Um, and in those situations, liability can go up the chain. Sometimes uh, senior management, the mid-level management, uh, even uh, sometimes as high as ownership can be involved in those uh, activities. Uh, but there's actually a, 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 a very significant consequence to those types of prosecutions, which a lot of nursing homes, I believe, are unaware of, which is that, and this is an example of it that I have up on the screen. You'll see this was a, a, a director of nursing who pled guilty to covering up uh, destroying a witness's statement in connection with an investigation. Um, and while that in and of itself is a, 
was obviously a, a devastating thing for the nursing home, the fact that their director of nursing pled guilty to that. Because the director of nursing is a senior management position in the nursing home, under New York law, when the senior management of a corporation engages in criminal conduct and is acting on behalf of the corporation, the corporation itself is guilty of that conduct. So what that means is that senior management binds the corporation. When senior management commits crimes, the corporation commits crimes. And when nursing homes commit crimes, the consequences are severe. It can result in exclusion from federal health care programs. They can result in uh, monetary sanctions and a variety of penalties. Now, there's another, so in the next slide we see that that's exactly what happened. Uh, as a result of that guilty plea by the director of nursing, they were able to uh, take action against the nursing home uh, and its uh, top officials and owners because they had that they already had that guilty plea from the senior management. Now, that brings us to uh, the most recent and, and perhaps one of the most uh, sort of troubling trends I've seen in New York State uh, in connection with the Medicaid Fraud Control Unit's uh, prosecution of nursing homes. We had a nursing home in Long Island that had an incident where a patient passed away uh, and nurses and nurses aides were prosecuted criminally for failing to respond to alarms that went off uh, and they went to trial and were convicted uh, which was terribly damaging for the nursing home uh, in and of itself however in that case the administrator of the nursing home was accused of failing to provide a particular document uh, to the investigators uh, at the time of the investigation and was therefore accused of uh, obstruction and falsification of records. Uh, when that administrator pled guilty to a misdemeanor, as I mentioned, as senior management who was acting on behalf of the nursing home, the, the nursing home no longer was, ability, was able to challenge their guilt of participation in the cover-up of a patient's death. Armed with that leverage, the Medicaid Fraud Control Unit then added on to that an allegation that the nursing home had inadequate staffing and connected the inadequate staffing with an allegation that the owners and operators of the nursing home were profiting excessively from the home. And in the end, the Attorney General ended up filing a three, two, $300 million lawsuit against that nursing home. Uh, along with criminal charges, alleging that because they had inadequate staffing, because they had this incident, they had obstruction, and because the owners and operators of the facility were making money, and the, the Attorney General in that case alleged they were making more than they were entitled to under the law, but in any event, they were making, they were profiting, that the profits result were the cause of inadequate care at the facility, and that as a result of the inadequate care, for a period of six years, every claim that the facility submitted to the Medicaid program was a false claim. And as a result, and that complaint survived the motion to dismiss and was going to go to trial. And the nursing home recognized that at that trial, there would be evidence of the patient death. Uh, there would be evidence of the conviction of the nurses. There would be evidence of the conviction of the administrator. Um, and there would be evidence of earnings by the uh, owners of the home. And as and they, then they faced potential uh, criminal sanctions for the misdemeanor. So they were essentially forced to reach a deal with the attorney general, which essentially turned the nursing home into a not-for-profit institution for no less than five years and turned operation of the nursing home over to the control of the attorney general. Um, so this theory that there's, there have been incidents of abuse, uh, there's an allegation of generally inadequate care, and the owners are profiting, 
has been used by the Attorney General to bring these mega cases, uh, which under, and once they get this hammer over the head of the nursing home, as they've shown in this case, they, they will extract extraordinary damages. Uh, the total amount here was $28 million, not to mention, as I said, five years of running the nursing home in the equivalent as a, as a not-for-profit operation uh, under the direction of the Attorney General. And what's worse in this case, the five years was not the outside maximum, it was the minimum the Attorney General under the settlement program had the right to extend that period if they felt that uh, it was necessary. So this type of uh, kitchen sink approach where they've got patient abuse and they've got cover-ups, they've got senior management guilty pleas, they've got a nursing home that is, uh, is profiting, uh, and then they've got this allegation of substandard care uh, can result in this type of settlement where essentially the owners of the nursing home are, are going to wait five to ten years before they ever earn another dollar from the operation of the nursing home. Um, so uh, that is my, that concludes my initial presentation. As I mentioned, everyone will get uh, by email a copy of the slides that we use today. Some of them I, I went through a little quickly uh, because I, had or, I was already explaining uh, what was up on the screen. But at this point, I want to invite anybody who has any questions to submit them uh, by typing them in. Uh, and I will uh, I will do my best to answer your questions now. Um, I see uh, we have a question. Um, someone wants to know uh, regarding the uh, uh, cover up issue and the changing of medical records. That uh, isn't it the case that because everybody is using electronic medical records now, it's really not uh, possible for nursing home staff to uh, manipulate records as part of a cover-up? And the answer is, the answer is no. That, the, the electronic medical records certainly make it harder because there's an audit trail anytime someone accesses an electronic medical record. However, if, if you go back to the case that I was describing uh, where the nursing home administrator uh, ended up pleading guilty. The, the director of I'm sorry, the director of nursing ended up pleading guilty. What she pled guilty to was destroying a handwritten statement that they had taken from a witness. So, you know, in an investigation uh, of an incident of abuse, uh, paper documents are still used. So during that investigation procedure, there's plenty of opportunity to uh, alter evidence. Uh, in addition, paper documents, even though there's an electronic me medical record, are still used for a number of uh, record-keeping functions, and, and they can be destroyed or altered. So, yeah, it, the electronic medical records does limit uh, the risk of uh, changing records to avoid an investigation, but it doesn't eliminate. Uh, there's another question about the, the staffing issue. And I mentioned, I think, uh, you know, with, with this kitchen sink uh, uh, approach that one of the things the Medicaid Fraud Control Unit threw into the case was that the, they alleged that the facility had inadequate staffing. Um, and the question is, how do you know what is adequate staffing? And, and the answer is there are no, there are no black and white. There is no black and white. There are no clear-cut numbers uh, of staff that you have to have. Um, however, I would recommend uh, the, the CMS nursing home evaluation system evaluates nursing homes on staffing levels. And I would recommend being familiar with where your facility stands in comparison to other facilities. Because if you're a one-star staffing facility, yeah, you're a potential target for that kind of kitchen sink. You're a potential target for the attorney general to come along and say, look at this, you've reduced staff, but you're taking profits. Why aren't those profits going to increase staff? Um, and so I, I do think you need to be aware of how you compare to 
other nursing homes in, in the state. Um, someone uh, uh, wants to know why the, in the Asformis case, the bribe to the coach of the University of Pennsylvania was relevant to a healthcare fraud prosecution. And that's a very good question. Uh, I think as Formis himself raised that issue uh, at the trial, uh, the government uh, claimed that it showed his disposition, what he did with the proceeds of his criminal conduct, uh, and they were entitled to demonstrate to the jury uh, what as Formis did with the money he stole. Uh, I'm sure that will be a subject on appeal because it does not seem to bear a great deal of connection to the uh, health care fraud that was charged uh, which was the underlying charge. Um, okay. All right. I, I don't see any more questions coming. Uh, I'm going to put uh, my information up on the screen. Uh, to the extent you have questions, as I mentioned, you'll get a copy of this. But to the extent that uh, you have questions, you should feel free to re reach out to me. And I'll just remind you again that this is only the first. We've got at least a dozen more of these webinars coming up and I invite you to peruse the list of topics and uh, I think you'll see that a lot of them are uh, important topics for you to be aware of and will be helpful. So I thank you very much for your time and thank you for listening.